And today we're going to do a painting demo called Focus on Eyes. I chose eyes because one thing, they fascinate me. Two, if you can paint an eye, if you can paint eyes, you can paint portraits because one of the most difficult things about painting portraits is that so much of the face isn't lines. It's the shade and the shadow and the transition that makes the shapes that make our faces three-dimensional. So I was just contemplating eyes and, and reading up a little. I have a book on expression that, that talks a lot about eyes. And one thing it said is that eyes are the hardest thing to paint. And one reason is because people think they know what eyes look like. You know, they like they look like little boop with a dot in the middle. But that's not what they really look like. That's our general childhood impression of them. Now, some people really study eyes intently because they're portrait artists and they really want to know how to paint eyes. And I did observe once at a show at the National Gallery of Art, a very famous portrait painter, that, you know, he, he painted beautiful portraits. But I began to wonder, you know, really most of what he was painting was the, the ladies' clothes and their jewelry. And this used to be something that they did a lot because that was what was important to them, was their clothes and their jewelry. Because these were the very, you know, well-to-do people that wanted to show off all of their wealth. But the eyes of the women in his paintings were almost all, almost exactly alike. And it's like, and I did hear that a lot of the time they had a model that would pose with the woman's clothes because these women, they didn't have time to sit for an, a portrait, especially a very detailed one. So they'd have somebody else, they'd pay a model to wear the clothes and have everything but the face painted. And then that person whose portrait it is would come in and he'd just do it. And I think that he just, instead of really looking carefully at each individual's eyes, would just paint a generic eye. It looked great. And what did we know? We don't know what these people really look like. So it didn't really matter. But the eyes do matter. I did a painting of eyes that you can see on my Facebook page on Roxana Cynics Artist. And I'll show it to you. When I was trying to figure out a name of this painting, my husband said, why don't you name it Smile? Of course, you don't see my smile at all. But the eyes themselves tell you that I'm smiling. If you paint a painting and the eyes don't show the smile, it looks like a pasted on smile. Like, it doesn't look like a smile. <laughs> That doesn't look like a real smile because the eyes kind of meet up a little when you smile, the bottoms raise up. So I started studying different eyes. I showed some of these at the end of my video on how to paint a cat as a preview. This is, I still haven't finished this. I've been so busy doing too many paintings at the same time. This is not quite finished, but it does show eyes in a very different way because I'm interested in all of these different ways. And you can think, what does this, what is this child thinking? You know, is he looking up to his big sister or what? So the other thing about eyes, just to give you a little bit of background information about what the eye really looks like. When you think of an eye and when you look at an eye to paint, it's one of the few spheres in nature, in our bodies anyway. It's not absolutely totally round because it's a little soft and squishy. I heard uh, um, the, the, this, this ball, this orb that our eyes are made up of, rest in the bone around our skull. As you probably know, you've seen skulls. And I heard a portrait artist once describe it as it's like if you have a little bowl and that's your skull and you break an egg and go plop and drop it into this little bowl. And that's kind of like what our eyeballs are in our skull. Like, plop, and then it's covered with skin. So the actual part you see 
there's just a little bit so you can see the orb of the eye and when you paint it you do have to think of it as a full ball because it's got you know the shade and the shadow depending on where you're looking but you're only seeing a little tiny part and then all of this skin just covers it and one thing about eyes is that this little tear duct at the end is not in the orb. You have the orb and then you have the tear duct. And eyes aren't flat like that. They tilt down just a little because this is the drain. So all your tears and all of the, when your eye washes itself, it all goes out that little drain. And that's why this point is actually lower than this point. It's just slightly higher. The other thing is about the shape of eyes is that on the upper lid, it, they go up steeply and then they go down slowly. And on the lower, they generally, you're, where, where your actual pupils located affects everything about the shape of the eye. But in general terms, it's flatter here and then it, it curves over to meet this. And the, the upper lid kind of overlaps the lower lid. So the lower lid comes in like this and the upper lid comes like that. All this is important to know when you paint eyes because if you know the background and how it should look, then when you look at it, it makes more sense. The other thing is that the widest part of the eye, like here, on the top lid and on the bottom, they don't line up exactly. Depends on, like I said, where your eye was. You can even, you can usually show, I'm trying to show it here, that you can actually see where that, um, the um, pupil, which is surrounded by the iris, you can often see on, especially on an older person, because their skin is um, thinner, my skin is pretty thin, you can see where the eyeball is, even when the eye is closed. I don't know if you can see that or not. It, it probably translates better in real life. <laughs> The other thing about eyes is that this place where your eyelashes are is not right next to your eyeball. There's a very light area. You can see see how this there's light here. And that's because that's a little flat paint plane as it comes off of your eyeball. And the light is generally from above. And so it shines down on this plane right there and it makes it light. And then your eyelashes are below that. Now I don't have eye makeup on, so you can probably, you might not even be able to see those lower lashes because they're very thin and um, more sparse. I'm also not a hairy person. I got lots of hair here, <laughs> but I don't have hair on my arms or your legs or, you know, it's just very scarce. But on the upper lid, you can see if I open up my eyes, there's a thickness there too. And the part actually next to your eyeball is not where the eyelashes come out. They come out right on the outer edge. And you can see how my eyelid follows this sphere, not where the tear duct is, but the rest of it follows the sphere. And because I'm older and because I have thin skin, this, this line where the eyelids go into is actually very deep. And that defines this bony area here because that's that bowl I was talking to you about. And that's why we have a lot of these lines under our eyes because you can feel it. You can feel the edge of that bowl that your eyeball is blocked into. So that's the basic structure of the eye. All of this up here is, is bone. Now, some people develop kind of a little lump right here a little bit. Yeah, there you can kind of see it over here. That's just, um, I'm not sure what that's called or what it is, but it's it's there. There's usually a little bit of a bulge right here in people's eyes. You can see how, you know, the, uh, there's a line coming down here. There's usually a little bit of a line right here. If I'm at the right angle, you can see it more. But, um, and then this comes down here. This is very soft and it's often redder. Eyes tend to be very red too. You can see how they're, they're very reddish unless you have eye makeup on. So 
it's just like hands and fingers they tend to be see how much redder they are it's just the way i guess there's more blood vessels there like lips and things like that but um so that's that's a lot about the basic structure of the eye oh the other thing is the size of your eyeball the, the iris i read and i didn't really measure this on me you can see i've got a little red over on this eye that's nothing to worry about sometimes that whole thing would turn red and i went to the doctor the first time it happened i go what's wrong and he said oh that happens there's nothing you can do about it it'll get over it's just like it doesn't mean anything it's just weird looking but anyway the the size of the pupil is supposed to be um a third of this whole thing of the eye that's what they i read it doesn't look quite like that to me if you if you do make the pupil too big you look more like a baby <laughs> maybe that'll make me younger but the reason is because baby's eyes the eyeball is like still the same size but because their face is smaller that little slit is smaller so i am drawing a, a one of the ones i'm painting Here's one with no eyelashes yet, because you can't, once you, you really have to get all this shade and the shadow and that detail around the eye before you start putting in the lashes. So in this one, she's got her eyes wide open. So you can see how important the orb is here. And I still need to do a little more shading. I've, I've shown some shading on this side and on this side. And with the lashes in, I know that there's going to be shade up here because there's usually always darker up here because the purpose of the eyelashes is to come out and make a little umbrella for your eyeballs for if it's raining or dirt things falling out of the sky all kinds of reasons that you might get something in your eye and you, those eyelashes protect your eye and that's why this it's like an awning that protects your eye from um things falling into it. So that's one thing. Like I said, this is not done. I'm working on it, but it's coming along. So I always like to work on several paintings at the same time, because then as far as drying time, if I want to let one dry, it gives me time to think about it and look at it and see if I have any more touch-ups to do. And, um, I also keep getting ideas. <laughs> I'm just getting ideas and inspiration, so I'll like get something all ready to start, and then it's waiting there. So, whenever you're finishing a painting, too, it's good to be starting the next one, especially with the underpainting and things like that, and preparation. So, what we're going to work on today, I'll actually take this. I've got it in the background right here. I'm going to show you how I start. First thing I did was I took a whole slew of pictures. And um, actually, they were of more of the whole face of this lady. And then I, I went through and I, I just looked at, at the more interesting eyes. And I put them all in a file because I'm on a file of lots of eyes. Those ones I've started, I have more of those too. Because I, I just, I want a diversity. I don't want all happy eyes. I want mad eyes. And I have one that looks like an evil wizard. And <laughs> that's really interesting. <laughs> and all kinds of different eyes. So anyway, then what I'm painting on is basically hardboard. It's um, it's like masonite, but it isn't oiled. Oil masonite is oiled, and, but it's a fine composite. I've used MDF a lot, that medium density fiberboard they use in cabinets. I think this is MDF. I actually had a bunch of panels that are, um, it's 12 inches by six inches. I had these cut for another purpose, but then um, that purpose disappeared. So now I have these boards. <laughs> so then I got, um, with your painting on a board, it's kind of cool because you can go to Home Depot and you can find some quarter inch hardboard and have them cut it up for you. They they have a little sign saying they won't cut it smaller than 12 by 12 or something. But if you if they're not busy and you could get somebody to help you, I find them find found them to be very generous with um, cutting what you want. And they 
they're supposed to charge like 50 cents a cup, but I don't have a really good saw, so it, to me, it's really worth it. Someday I'm going to get a nice table saw. <laughs> anyway, so first I cover it with acrylic gesso. You can see a tiny bit of the white here. I, I put three layers on and I sand it between each layer, not heavily sanding it, but I just want to rough it up and smooth up any of the bumps or whatever gets in there that you don't really want in there. So I've got a, three good layers and that, that helps the, both the, the surface. It gives you a good surface to paint on. And then I get some burnt sienna just because that's my favorite. A lot of people use a neutral gray and I get some paint thinner. Some mineral spirits is the same thing. And I just dab some on and then I get a, either a non-shredding paper towel or you can use a paintbrush. Paper towels are nice because you can throw them away, but sometimes they leave a lot of little particles if they're really soft, so, especially my favorite. The Viva paper towels can shred a little bit on there. So it's really good to use horrible paper towels like the kind in um, sometimes public restrooms or the ones that are very papery. And because then you can just smear it around. I, I pour a little paint thinner on and then I rub everything smooth. And sometimes I, I go like this and let it run back and forth because with the mineral spirits, what you want is a very, very thin background. You can tell this is doesn't look really like paint. It's more like a wash. And then in order to do that, I could do this. There's many ways to transfer what you want onto the board. And really I could spend you know, quite a bit of time describing different ways and different ways that have been done in the past. The camera Lucia was one of the first ways they transferred images, but all kinds of ways and means. And of course, one of the most convenient, but most difficult ways is to just look at what you're doing. I mean, look at your subject matter, whether it's live or in a photograph and then sketch it out. But don't use pencil, use charcoal or charcoal pencil, because there's something about the oiliness of the pencil that can interfere with the paint. Now, I've never seen this happen, but I've been told it by many teachers over many years, so I just don't do it. But charcoal is fine. You don't want a real heavy charcoal, but it, uh, something fairly soft. You don't want a big line. You don't want it to smear. And what I do is I um, actually, in portraiture, I don't do this with flowers and landscapes or, or maybe just very rudimentary when I spend a lot of time working out the composition, which actually I need to mention composition, which can transfer the image. Um, by taking, let's see if I have an example. I think I threw it out. Let me see. Um, I threw it out, but I didn't empty the trash. Okay. So what I do is I, I print a copy of the painting I want to paint on paper, not on photo paper, regular paper. Or you can take a photograph and photocopy it. But um, then I get charcoal. You can use carbon paper or um, graphite paper, but what I do is I, I put I put charcoal all on the back and then I tape it onto my board and then I get a ballpoint pen and I just go over the placement of things so, so I can get everything where I plan them because I plan this all out in advance. Right? But that way I can get all, everything where I want it because Backing up, I just said a few minutes ago, oh, I need to talk to you about composition. When you plan your painting, you've got to consider composition. Because if you don't, the painting is not going to be very good, no matter how beautiful your technique is. And there's many, many concepts in composition, but I teach the easy way because pretty effective and you can deviate some from this because sometimes your subject matter demands it but um even something that's filling the page like this what i did is in in most or in most of the photo processing programs on your computer i use photoshop elements it'll give you when you go to crop it'll give you a third grid and so it divides it in thirds horizontally and vertically and so what you want to do 
Every painting should have a center of interest. And I'm doing eyes. And, and there are certain things that really draw your mind. A center of interest is where your eye goes first when you see the painting. You're drawn to that. And eyes are the number one center of interest. Human eyes in any painting. You have a painting, people will look at the eyes first. So, and if it's an, if it's an animal, they'll still look at the eyes. But if there's an animal person, they generally look at the person's eyes first. And one of these is a forward eye. And one of them is a, a back eye. And in here, this would be the forward eye. And so, and so what I did is, is I, the, you want to, the, the center of interest should ideally be at the intersection between one of the one third lines, which go this way, and the one third lines that, that go, go vertically. And this forward eyeball in the light, the, the horizontal one goes right along this lid because it also wants to go along strong horizontals. And these bottoms of the lids are strong horizontals because obviously you can put it on the eye, but there's a lot of space that the eye takes up. So uh, it depends. Like I said, you have to use some ju aesthetic judgment here too. But the, the vertical line crosses the horizontal, like right there. And so this is a perfect place. It's called a sweet spot. That's the perfect place for the center of interest. This eye is is behind. It's darker. It's secondary to this eye. So that is is your center of interest, and it's planned to be there. And that's one reason a lot of my faces are offset somewhat because I'm trying. I don't want it to just you know it just a face like this can be. Sometimes the the requirements of the program demand that, but. Basically, if you can offset, even if it's the eyes or the main feature or something important or a strong vertical or horizontal, when you have a, you know, a sail or a, um, something very flight pole, that's really best located at that third vertical. And um, on a landscape, the horizon line where the, the land and the sky meet, that's a very strong horizontal. And that is normally best placed in the bottom third or the top third. It's bad in the middle. There are things in composition that just don't normally work. There's exceptions to almost every rule, but that's a, that is something that normally you do not want a horizon line smack dab in the middle. So as you can see, this is, this is a third down. Even though the eyes are fairly much in the middle, you can see that there's a lot more space here, though. I wanted to catch the forehead and these wrinkles in the forehead because they indicate that the eyebrow is lifted and it's pulling up everything in the eye here and see how the cheeks are elevated. And that's because this woman is smiling, just like mine. So um, those are all, all things that I wanted to include because they they tell about the expression. Um, well, something else I was going to say about composition. I, I will tell you something. I tell, <laughs> I say this over and over, so a lot of you probably already heard it. Almost everything I tell you, there's almost, there's more than one way to do virtually everything. And different artists have different ways of doing things. And so I will tell you the way I do them. And I've tried a lot of different ways. I certainly haven't tried all the ways. And there are, like color mixing is a big one, skin color. You can get exact same color by mixing different combinations of color. I just, I learned a basic combination that works really well. And then I can add or subtract to, to make the skin yellower or pinker or browner or whatever it is. But um, there is, there are rules. There are some rules that you should never break. And the most obvious one to me is do not ever drink your paint thinner because it's poison. So you don't want to do that. So if you have a drink, like I always have water on the side, don't put it right with your paints and your paint thinner. This is my paint thinner. It's in a jar. If I have a glass of water next to it, you get absorbed in your painting. You don't really look or pay attention. You pick it up and drink it. 
bad idea. Very bad idea. So that's just an example. I'm sure there's others, but that's the one I want to think of first because it is honestly very easy to do. So keep your drink on a different table or if you're eating food. And it's actually not that great to eat food because some oil paints are toxic and most particularly some contain lead, although those mostly are, uh, they come up with substitutes. But all the cadmiums, which are beautiful, wonderful paints, cadmium is a heavy metal and it is toxic. And so you need to have caution when you're using it. Try not to get it on your hands. If you do, try to get it off fairly soon because you don't want it in your bloodstream. They are coming up with more and more cadmium free paints and there are artificially formulated paints. A lot of them, a lot of painters don't really like because the, the color is slightly, it's just a little different. Maybe it isn't as saturated and that's when you two get into quality of paints. But their Utrecht, which was bought out, they were bought out by Dick Blick a number of years ago. So as an example, it's probably going to be reversed, but um, because that's, when I want to read your notes, I have to have the camera facing me and it does, um, it does reverse it. So I am having a little thing here. It says, Brian Dodd is watching, bring them on camera. I'm going to try this and see what happens if I click this, because I've never done this. Let's see what happens. What happens? Your friends won't be able to watch this live video unless they're in your selected audience. Let's try this, Ed. See what happens. Nothing's happened yet. They keep changing things on Facebook, so you never know. <laughs> Either I did it wrong or it's not happening. I don't understand. Anyway, I guess I'll learn about that. But anyway, my point is this is cadmium free paint. And it seems to be, I've been using it, it seems to me just as good as cadmium yellow light. And um, I've been very happy with it, but Utrecht makes it, for, and Dick Blick sells it if you order online since the store is closed right now. That's just an ad, unpaid. And <laughs> so I have my painting ready to paint. Sometimes I don't even follow the lines this much, but the point is once you've got them on there, you have more confidence to just dive into the painting. It, it like gives you that, like, okay, where do I start? Oh, this is a good place to start. So anyway, when I start a painting, right now I, I usually have a, a several pictures that I refer to, not just what I'm painting. This I have, this is a copy on paper of this lady's eyes. And it's to the exact same scale that this is. So luckily it's a small scale. If you want an exact same scale one, to do the tracing, you have to have the exact same scale. And you might have to go to a shop that has mixed large reproductions. Or you can, I, I, there's also a grid method that's extremely effective that I'll teach in another video because I know a very easy way to make a, bri a grid with no math because I don't like to mix math with painting. It doesn't work in my brain very well. It's just like a screen that says, no, 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 please don't put math in my head when I'm trying to paint. But I also have a picture that I print them on photo paper. I had, you have to be careful with your um, color on your printer because you can get it perfect on your screen and then it's not perfect on your printer. I was having trouble with red, so I take out more red. I had to go over to her house and say, let me see the color of your face because I'm having problems. <laughs> Which is nice and you should do people you live with for a while. And this is another picture I shot of the same lady. You can see this is more accurate with her skin color. I love this picture. Maybe I'll paint that too. Not right now, but um, it also, it is very helpful when you're doing any kind of portrait that you don't just have the picture you're painting from. If you have other pictures of the same person, it's real helpful. I actually flipped this, which is important because I wanted it more like the one I was going to paint, but she has this funny little, this interesting little divot over this eyebrow. And you can see it in this painting. I mean, this it'll be on the other side here because I flipped this because she's looking the other way, but it's right here. 
And you just don't know sometimes, is this something that's a characteristic? That's a characteristic. It could be just something that um, looks funny in that for some reason, or maybe it's a something they have. Like I painted one lady that had a cleft in her nose here. That was very obvious in the one I was painting. Um, it, it was a picture her husband gave me. And I wondered, is that something that just happens to be catching the light funny in this picture? Or is it something that is a characteristic that makes her look like her? Um, so I asked him for more pictures so I could see how expressed is this characteristic. So I didn't paint something that might not usually show. And then they go, what's that? I never saw that in my face before. So that's important. I have a, a third. This is another example of how her skin color looks totally different here. It looks very light. She had a, this was late afternoon when we took these pictures and there was a, this really got blown out in the picture. And um, like I said, my printer is taking a lot of red out, but she's very dark and this does not show very dark. And I wanted to preserve that because I love that really dark skin is so beautiful, so rich. So um, I worked pretty hard at trying to get an accurate uh, skin tone. And that's another reason for having multiple pictures. So the way I start, Lay out my paint on my palette, like I always do, with a starting with the darkest earth tone. There it is. And then moving up to the lighter earth tones. I didn't put any yellow in right now because um, it usually goes right in this slot. I wasn't, I was very dubious as to whether I'd even be using yellow. I got two reds, a warm red and a cold red. It's cadmium red light and lizard crimson. And then I have my two blues, a cool one and a warm one. That's ultramarine which also mix very well with burnt umber, which can make black. But I have black here too, because sometimes to get a very cold gray, this is ivory black. And cold gray can help turn corners. And um, it's also a lot of this, the sun, the midday sun is a very cold blue gray when it is coming to the reflections. So it's good to have black, even though you can make black very easily out of burnt umber and ultramarine. And the advantage of doing that is you can make it colder and bluer by just adding a larger proportion of ultramarine, or you can make it a warmer or very dark brown by using the burnt umber. And there's your other. We have um, black burnt umber, raw umber, burnt sienna, raw sienna, and yellow ochre. And I can tell you the basic, while well, I'm here on color, the basic skin tone that you can use, that's an easy combination that I use, is your um, alizarin crimson and yellow ochre and white. Now, sometimes you want to throw in some cadmium red light. Some people make it with cadmium red light, but when I, it's always just too bright when I do it with just pure cadmium. So if you're, if you're dealing with areas, like if you ever see a sun shining through an ear, oh my gosh, it is just this brilliant red orange. Just brilliant. It can be beautiful color, but like, I make that. But that's really good with the cadmium red light. And the other reason we have cadmium red light is you want a really light red because if you add white to red, you don't get light red, you get pink. So one time you don't want pink, you want light red. But the reds also, especially the um, laser and crimson is a transparent color. And that's another thing about color. Color in itself is such a huge subject, but some paints are transparent, which means when you put them on, you get the color, but you can see what's underneath. An opaque, you can't see what's underneath. White is very opaque. There's your white. If you're doing fog, see this stuff next to it? That's medium. It's clear. And if you mix your paint with medium, it, it thins it down and it makes it more like a transparent. But the transparent paints themselves are most effective for that. But red is a transparent, generally speaking. Certainly a lizard and crimson. And so one way to make it light is plan ahead, paint your surface that you want to be red, paint it white, let the white dry. 
and then put the cadmium, I mean the um, laser and crimson over that white and it'll show through and you'll have a much lighter color there. And any you can do that with any of the transparents. If you need to cover up something and change it, then you need to put something opaque on it. And if you want to cover it and if you want a, a um, transparent color over a mistake, then you can paint it white or white with something else mixed in it, depending if you don't want it white, but that'll make it opaque to cover up. And then you can paint the transparent or whatever you want on top. And the other one is a um, Prussian blue, which is, um, this is very cold. Alizarin is cold. Prussian is much warmer. It's like a little bit, it's blue, but it's a little bit greener blue, even though it's not blue green. There is Prussian green, which is green. And I usually put my greens here, but for now, I'll probably use the greens later in the process because it's really good in aiding your shadows and things. But right now we're, what we want to do is block out the color, get your basic darks and lights is the most important thing, but get your basic color in there. When you're painting, as this is true with many things besides painting, you want to keep the whole painting pretty much at the same stage. So you don't sit here. The one of the worst things you can do is sit here and render this one eye just absolutely perfectly when the rest of the painting isn't even started. The reason for that is sometimes something else in the painting is affected by this eye and you realize something's wrong with this eye. It's like too big, too small. When you draw it all out, that's harder for that to happen. But at the same time, you just don't want to mess it up if you worked real hard on it, even though that's what you should do. So it's good to just kind of keep the whole thing going up at about the same rate. So now we're going to get down to business and we're going to um, first block in the lights and the darks. So what I do first, I take my reference photo. Now these don't have to be accurate colors. So there are some really light areas in this. So I'm just going to underpaint them in white. Always use a, you normally, the rule of thumb is use a bigger brush than you think when you go to grab a brush, use a bigger one. Because people tend to think of um, smaller brushes as giving you more control. But smaller brushes are for small things. And if I did this with a um, the wrong side, if, if I use this with a small brush, not only would it take much longer, but I'd have all these little lines. Now you can see I, I painted it a little high here, and I can't ignore it because I'm going to be covering it up with skin tone, which has a lot of white in it, so it's fairly opaque. But at the same time, I can wipe off some of this extra, because what's under it is dry. And I'm trying to just get some basic shapes at this point. So that's good enough. So let's see what was I, I did my reference photo. It's interesting that in the actual photo, as opposed to, I mean, the photo on photo paper, the white is a much more um, white. And see, so I have to kind of judge where this is kind of in the center of her nose, there's the flanges. It's pretty much right in the center there where the light comes down. And it comes down here. See, I can see this edge of this flange. That's these little, these are flanges. And keep your paint thin because then you can um, paint over thicker. The, the, the policy, the best policy is uh, um, or technique is, is to paint thick over thin. But put the paint thin, the, the thinner paint below. One thing that does is if you do change it, if you change your mind on something, you don't have to fight ridges on paint that is underneath the, the main layer. Now, the one this really shows the white there. To see these, these, where is it? I'm looking at what I'm doing, not the camera. These are the main areas of white. 
And we're painting them white now. See up here and up here. But it's under painting because they're really not white. And this is where you can't believe the camera. You know it's light. But if you were looking at her, it might be pretty bright. But you would still see this is not white. It's skin color. It's just a very light skin color. I'm going to go back to this because I'm measuring things with my eyeballs as I do this. And this is the same scale, and it's just easier. So I can see like this one is slightly above this. I know where that is. And these skin areas, I don't know where everything is yet, so I have to use judgment. I'm kind of measuring with my eyes as I go. But these lines I have on here are, are helping quite a bit. If I put a little too much white on, like I said, it's fine. We're going to go over this. We're just getting things basically indicating those values. The lights and the darks are the values, and they're actually more important than the color. I just want the color right. Some people don't care about color. They paint alternate colors. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just I want them more accurate because that's my... That's me. That's my purpose. See, these are actually, it's a lot of reflected sky in there. I do think that you get more of the reflection of color in photographs. So it can help you see things that are very difficult to see with your eyes. You have to be careful in painting um, any kind of wrinkles in an older face because you, you tend to focus so much on them that you, you make them too prominent. And that can be a mistake, certainly. The people whose picture is don't like it. But, um, anyway, I can see a lot of blue blue in this. I'm actually covering up a very important line, so I'm going to use my handy paper towel. And that, that important line indicates the transition between the outer eyelid and, you know, where I showed you it goes back in toward the eyeball. And that's a, a very important, I was trying to, to capture, where is it, this area actually shows blue here, that light. She has a lot of light over here. I'll just be painting over her eyelashes because you have to put in those eyelashes much later in the day because it's just too hard to paint under them. Might as well cover them up and start over if you have to do that. And then we have these folds and layers that aren't as white, so I'm just gonna add a little. This is real strong. But again, I want to keep it thin. And then there's some kind of coming up here. Let's see, she doesn't have much on her ear. The ears usually catch a lot of light at the top. And her hair is actually very black. It's interesting how the camera has made it very blue here. But I know there's some highlights in here. She's a little gray in her hair, but not a lot. When you look at her, you really just see you know, very dark hair. We've got some general hair. Oh, a little on the flange. I got that. It's a little bit over here. This whole area is lighter, but it's it's nowhere near the really light areas that we're looking for. There's some coming down here. Oh, and there's some up here. It's all up here. This area is a, a very important area for expression. She's got her eyebrows lifted, but I think in general she's got the high eyebrows. I have very high eyebrows, especially if I go like that, they're lower. If I go like that, they're really high. But a lot of people's eyebrows just, you know, like sit right here. So um, 
the differences between people. So, and the light of her eyes, you know, it's not really where all the light is shining, but even there you can see, you know, I was talking about the orb, this orb is much darker at the edges. It's very blue there. Basically, basically the younger people have the bluer in their whites, their eyes, and older people have more yellow in the whites of their eyes. But she's not a little child and she still has that blue. I think it's a lot because this was taken outside and you do get that reflection from the sky. I'm just going to indicate a little light here at the lightest part. Okay. A little light there. So now I'm going to look at the really dark areas. Now I know her eyes, it's really hard to see her eyes here, looking at my other picture. I do have more pictures on my computer here. It, it, I, I'm, I'm seeing the light here on her eyes. And they look like a, um, here that looks like a light brown. I'm not sure exactly how dark brown her eyes are. They look fairly dark brown. My eyes are brown, but they're light brown as opposed to, y'all probably know my son's story. Somebody, look at his eyes, they're this really dark, really chuckly brown. I just love them. He's my son. I spent a lot of time looking at his eyes when he was a child. Let's see. See my eyes? They're brown. Let's see. Hmm, can you see? Yeah, it doesn't show very well. Try to open them wide. They're very actually light brown. I think that the camera makes them look a little darker. They were darker, I think, when I was young, but my hair was browner and lighter when I was young, even though it was always brown. Okay, so now I want to get the dark, so I'm going to get a different brush. I do want a smaller brush for doing these detail areas, but a larger for doing some of the other areas. So let's see. We'll start with those darkest. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking. I could use a smaller one for this, and I'll probably need a smaller one for that, but um, I'm just going to use this for now. And I'm going to use a, a, a burnt umber. It's really dark brown, and then I'll lighten it up. I'm going to do this fairly carefully because I want to I want to get these lines right the first time so I don't spend a lot of time with corrections. There always is some time spent with corrections because even if you have it all drawn in, in invariably you um, don't color within the lines. And sometimes your line isn't right either. So you've got to measure what looks right with what you have. Sometimes what you have isn't right. Even if you traced it, Even if you trace, there's an awful lot of stuff that takes a lot of um, practice, and judgment. This is not a coloring book. But this this orb, the, one thing about the eyeballs, the 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 irises, the colored part of your eye, and the the pupil is always right in the middle. Of the iris. The iris might be cut off by your eye. And this is one reason the shape is so important because it's round. But when it's cut off, if you get the roundness wrong, it can make the eye look like it's looking in another direction. You get, you know, cross-eyed or wall-eyed. So it's that round shape is very important. However, it's only round if you're looking directly at a person. If they're like this, like especially I'm gonna look this way not at the camera, but when you look away from the other person that's looking at you, the uh, roundness becomes an ellipse. It becomes narrower and taller, and that's really important because that, that describes where you're looking. And if you make it round, it's not gonna look right. 
So we have to be careful of that. And like I said, the, the, the shape. If I were to make this, this circle here go down too flat here, it would totally throw the whole thing off. And that's why it just makes it really easier to trace that out because it's hard to get right and it's an extremely important thing. Mostly I trace things when I'm doing portraits because honestly, sometimes a 30 second of an inch, which is really small, it can make all the difference between something looking right and something looking wrong. And by that, you know, it's, it's the um, getting getting that essence of the person that, um, to really make it look like them. And to keep their personality in it, because there is a fine line between copying an image and picking up a personality. And that's hard to define. I like, I've heard from people say, well, it looks like the picture, but it doesn't look like him. And that makes, that's a hard thing for the artist to, especially if you don't know the person and you've never met them, because sometimes they give you a picture that's going to be a gift for somebody and you don't know the person. And it's almost impossible to really pick up that essence of the person. But if you know them, if you know them well, you can see it. And it's, it's hard to define what makes it look like them and not just like the picture of them. Because pictures don't always, photographs do not always look like the person in the photograph. Believe it or not, it's true. So I'm being very careful on these eyes. And I will be going through them because, as you can see, um, I was like working some on these eyes. See how th that's not just blue or gray or anything else. It's it's all kinds of different um, shapes and everything like that. And I, I don't have it perfect yet. Like I said, I'm working on that. But I want it to look like that, that blue and all of the intricacies with it. Now, getting it round in the middle, I need a smaller brush. I don't want the width of the brush showing it up. And this time I'm going to use just pure black. It's outside, and that's why the pupil is very small. It's bright. Sometimes it's, it's hard, too, to get the... It's very important that the eyes look the same way. And one thing I've noticed, even in the photograph, they don't always look exactly the same way. Because <laughs> sometimes people are a little cross-eyed or a little wall-eyed, especially when they're tired. My mother's one eye would wander a little bit. You can notice it usually unless you're really looking. When she was tired, it would only happen when she was tired. Okay, so that's the black part. And I'm sure there's some black parts that I don't want to use a little brush for that, that's for sure. Um, this was my brown. So I've got that, uh, that brown on this brush. I'm just going to go over here and stick it in the ultramarine and make some black and get some of these shadows in her hair. And it, this does not show the shape. It's just going to show, you know, some of the, the dark areas and giving me an indication for that. And the hairline is hard. It, it's really quite gray. Even in this other picture, I can see she's she's got gray. Where is it? Right there. Right there. She's got some gray hair. Don't normally notice it, but it is there. One of the tricky things about portraits is um, some people want to look like they really look with all their flaws and everything because then it really looks like them. Other people don't. You know, the old, can you shave off like 
30 pounds. <laughs> I've had that before. And once I did a portrait for somebody, this is a good example. It was a Christmas present. I, I never saw these people. The mother was giving it as a gift. And um, she gave me a photograph. I painted the photograph because that's what she wanted. And I didn't know the people. They were appalled when they got it because they had gone on a diet and they'd each lost quite a bit of weight. And then this reminded them of what they looked like before they lost the weight. And it was like, no! <laughs> so she had to bring the, the picture back to me and she said, can you please like shave some pounds off these people? They were really unhappy. <laughs> these things happen. This is actually, I'm just trying to indicate this a little bit. It's just, what I want to do really is preserve, get some kind of a preservation of this hairline. And I want to really rework this, but the fact is, if I know where that hairline is, it, it's going to disappear, you know, as I add paint and everything. The hairline's going to disappear. And if there's some paint there showing me where that line was, it's just going to make it a lot easier later on. But I really don't want to brush this small because i got big areas to cover and um, it's just not going to work for me. Okay. You can do that later. I want to start blocking out some of the areas of her face that are darker. And I'm trying to get a good brush. One thing about brushes that you'll find, this is an example. This is a bristle brush. It's white bristles. They're fairly stiff. They hold a lot of paint. They hold up to wear and tear. When they get old and rough, they're really good to make. Um, so for painting fur, I'm trying to find one to show you. That one's not. This this might you might see this better. Can you see how rough that is on the video? I'm trying to get a dark background. That's a great fur brush. Used to look more like this. This is actually a flat, and this was a filbert. Filberts are rounded at the top. Um, this is just an example of a sable. They're very very soft, and they're really good for blending. Um, but they, they kind of collapse under the paint when you paint, they just get, um, they're a little too soft sometimes. They make a big solid mark when you sometimes don't want one. They're really good for blending. You have to kind of get you to know your brushes by using them, but basically the bigger areas are really great with bristle brushes. The bigger brushes are, are bristle brushes like this is. This is a good example of a filbert that's rounded at the top. And it's a good all-purpose brush. Most of the ones I use are filberts. And this is not real huge, but it's bigger. But it's really good for big areas, like doing this area here. And um, then I use a lot of these um, mongoose. They're, they're actually artificial, I think they're artificial, synthetic mongoose. And I use usually the zero and the two, the the most for an all-purpose smaller brush. They have their filberts and they're narrower on one side, especially when they're new. They're really narrow on one side, so you can use them for fine lines. They're much fatter that way so that you can use them for bigger. But you don't want to just use them for bigger. It's one thing it wears out the brush prematurely. And the other thing is it just, it makes a line here kind of thing. So anyway, I want to block in some of the darker areas. Um, and it's interesting, this is a very blue-black kind of. It's a lot of blue in black skin. And I'm going to mix up some burnt umber with some altering. Didn't get quite enough here. Not really trying to make black. I'm trying to make a gray, a kind of dark blue-gray. But I, it's close to black, and that's for some of these areas. You can see here where I'm looking at the wrong thing. Here, there's a lot of dark blue gray and there's, um, you know, a lot of blue in here because of the reflection of the sky. I don't know how well you can see that. It's none of this is, it's showing black, black, but I don't want to paint it black, black because you've got to learn what's the difference between reality and a photograph. 
So, uh, Lena, thank you too for telling me the brushes show up well. I don't always know these things. So, um, anyway, let's let's get this blocked in. We'll tweak it later. Let's see what color this is. Very blue. So I'm gonna add a little more. I don't want it black, but I'm adding more of that burnt umber because it's a little bit too light and a little bit too blue. But like I said, if it's too blue, that's okay. Because right now we're blocking in. These are the dark areas. And if you want to follow along and you're not, you don't have your supplies, you can always, you know, pull up this video later. And you can use your own picture. You don't have to paint this lady. You can go take a picture of your husband or kids or wife or aunt or neighbor or sister or brother, whatever. You can just paint their eyes and see how it goes because the principles are all going to be pretty much the same. Everybody's got, we're humans. The differences are not that big, even if the skin tone might be a different color. You know, we still got eyes. I still have irises and pupils and darkness under them, even the children. Okay. Just going to concentrate a little bit here. It's a lot of dark here. You can get an amazing amount of control out of even a, um, a large brush. I've got no black here. But it's very, very dark here. Let's see. Some of this I'm just blocking in very thinly because um, it's it's a lighter dark. Noses are interesting. I only have a hint of the nose here, but except for the area around the nostril, noses have no lines. They're all the changes in value, the darks and the lights. There. There's a lot of, um, yeah, I've got that reflective light down there. Got this. This is actually extending. Ooh, that's blue. I need some more. Try to put a little raw umber. Raw umber is um, not chocolatey, whereas the burnt umber is chocolatey. Of course, when I add the blue to it, it's not so chocolatey, but it's not the same as, as raw. I was described raw well as the the darkness in blonde hair. Side goes there. Okay, I think I'm gonna go into my browns real soon. All of this is just kind of dark, but not all the way dark. Oh, here's a dark area. This area in the ear. You can see what I mean by blocking out. I'm just kind of roughly going over where some of these areas of high contrast, the, the very dark and the very light. You can actually do a whole, a whole drawing that way. I'll show you if I, right, um, I'm gonna fetch something, I'll be right back. You can practice this by getting some toned paper 
This is a drawing I did of my husband a number of years ago that is all done on just a, a gray paper. And all I did is I did what I'm doing here. I looked at all of the lights and then I looked at all of the darks and I just filled out those lights and darks. And it didn't really draw lines at all. I just colored in the lights and colored in the darks and I got the image. This is a little rougher because I know I'm gonna be adding the color. So I'm not going into the kind of detail I went here because there's a lot of little subtleties here, but it just shows that, you know, I told you that the values are what's important. That's the lights and darks. This is a value study. So, um, you know, his skin really isn't that color. <laughs> that one is drawn from life. It's real. It's really fun to draw from life. It's harder to paint from life for me anyway. But I, I can't draw from a picture. It just doesn't feel right. So do what feels good. Okay, so now I need some brows. I'm gonna get start with a bristle with a bristle brush. And you know, I want more of a full brush. A lot of mine have kind of worn down. Let's see if I can find a good full brush. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty worn, but it's a good size. Ah, this one will do. This one's pretty good. See? Do -do -do. It's a filbert, but it's not. It's a little worn, but I don't like the flats for when I'm doing rounded edges. I need some more. For a bit. I don't put a lot of um, paint on my palette because um, I can always add more, but it's really hard to get back in the tube. But most of the time you really, you might be able to get a little back in if you really try, but especially if you've mixed on your palette, you don't want to get any mixed color in. It's just generally not recommended to try to get it back in the tube. It's better just to um, throw it out at that point and start over. Okay, now on the skin, I, I'm going to be jumping back and forth between the, the paint, the, the image I'm painting and this, because this is not the same, but it has, it shows her skin color better. Now I've got a pretty dark color on here now. And I want to add a little, you know, I said normally you make skin color Caucasian skin color out of um, alizarin and yellow ochre and white. And even black people, that's a lot, a basis for a lot of it. I'm starting still going over some of these darker areas. So um, I've got more of a, um, a burnt umber. That's, her skin is, it has a lot of burnt umber in it. In here, there's a lot of red. So I'm gonna just throw some red up here. But that's where the, um, the light is, you got a transition area here where it's going from the, um, it's going from a very deep shadow to a lot of light. And so you're getting, that's a lot of where the color comes out is, is where the, um, the transition, the transition between light and dark. And it's pretty, pretty severe transition there. It's very rapid, it goes from very dark to very light. And this is all kind of more red down here. Okay, so I think I'm gonna, Keep this brush for dark and I'm gonna move over to a lighter brush. I'm gonna go just use this one I used for white before because I'm gonna mix up some normal, normal, I should use the word normal, Caucasian skin tone that I'm gonna to then tweak darker. I just call it that because I paint more Caucasians than black people because I paint my family and some of my family are black, but um, a lot of them are white, or what we call white. 
isn't white at all. We're all just different shades of skin tone. Okay. So there's a, a puddle of um, more like Caucasian skin tone. And, you know, in, in any of the these things where she's more accurate, maybe you've got a little bit here. for those lighter areas again. The transition areas. This is an interesting area here. So it's got a lot more red in it. But it's really kind of an alizarin red. Alizarin is um, like more um, ro rosy colored. as opposed to kind of more orangey. A lot of time you can, because it's an oil paint and it doesn't dry right away, what's great is you could do some of your color mixing right on your canvas or board. You don't have to mix everything on your palette. I can put this down and then it will add, you know, if I put some skin tone above, see it's, I'm just mixing it right here. So, the skin's got more yellow in it, so I'm going to add some more yellow. But this is just a base, like I said. You start with a base and you build it up and tweak it. Just keep looking at your pictures and, and following what you see. And frequently, as you get going and moving more into it, back up and look at it from a distance. It's, uh, I'm using a lot of um, raw sienna right now. Which I'll, I'll tweak darker. Let's move into these darker areas. But I don't want it too dark. I want it just right. See if there's any comments. This is pretty dark over here. You don't get that. There's really so many different nuances of color. That's one reason that, that portraiture is so fascinating. <laughs> I love portraiture. It's not easy, but it's just, what well, helps to, I love people. I love how they're just so interesting. And, and uh, all those expressions, I guess that's why I'm doing the eyes really. It's, it's, it's how, much, how much you can communicate by reading somebody's eyes. You read about this in books and a lot of time you, you know, they say, the eyes, you know, she could tell he was lying because of his eyes or she could see the love in his eyes. It's like, really? You can see the love in his eyes? I mean, he's looking at you. But, you know, it's kind of far-fetched sometimes, I think, in books. <laughs> but it's fun to read. One reason I'm putting dabs of color on is because, um, you know, I can always blend them out later, but I don't always get them exactly right. And it helps me kind of measure them. It's like cooking and you keep kind of, you know, you stirring the pot and adding things and you're tasting it. And it's like, oh, it needs a little more salt. It needs some more margarine. It needs some more of this, that. And so that's kind of what I'm doing here. It's like, going through adding dabs of color and then looking at them like tasting tasting my stew and 
sometimes it comes up with some pretty interesting things. Right, what do you think of that? <laughs> so there's all these words. Okay. This is very dark here. As you can see, I'm not using a lot of paint. Because a lot of this I'm going to go over. And you just don't want to be fighting too much paint. It is really dark over here. Some of that might be over here. You can get that alter the, the the you know, like I said, if you want to make your brown darker, you just add some altering. And it'll make like burnt rubber really dark. So it turns black. And you're getting a little dab over here over here. But I'll put that in later. She's got a little shine over. One thing is that um, there's certain areas that you do get a lot of light. And in faces, this area here is lighter. And then um, just above the eyebrows, you, you've got a ridge line of bone in there. It's not as, because my eyebrows are very high, I don't think you're seeing it as much. But there's always, in faces, you've got a darker area here. And then it, it turns lighter above the eyebrows because you can feel actually it goes out there. And um, most of your light is coming from above. So it's normally darker in here. Of course, light in here where it's coming down, but then lighter here. And then, you know, it's just this constant um, rolling color palette. So. But we're not real worried about the details now. We're, we're just getting blocks of coloring. It's amazing, even though it's rough as it is, how helpful that's going to be to us later on in the day. Okay, no more of that. See, a lot of my mixing, I just kind of pull down the colors. I'll start with like this, and I'm just kind of pulling at the edge. And um, actually, I'm mixing it a lot with that. This is my my two siennas, the burnt sienna being being much redder, closer to a brick color, and the raw sienna being um, yellower. And you'll see the, in the face, the colors, they're just like undulating in and out. Most of the yellow ochre is not as prevalent in the black skin. It's this in the white. And the, the birds, the raw sienna is a good, um, gives you a lot of that same, the yellow, adding the yellowish tones to the skin without that yellow, yellow, without the, um, the lightness of, of yellow ochre. One thing about oil paints too is the more you blend, the more you get a neutral. So if I sat here, I just kept blending and blending and blending, everything would be just this one neutral brown. And that's one reason for this underpainting too. So it helps, if you don't over blend it, it helps those colors to, um, to stay unique and to have that contrast you want. Because the under darkness and everything says, oh, yeah, don't forget, it's going to be dark. It's easy to get carried away. 
very dark in here. But there's still, this is, it looks like a line, but you can just blend it out because it's more of a, um, a dark area rather than a line. It's not really a line at all. It's a little later in there. That's not the right color. <laughs> okay, let's go back to these. That just looks gray. Sometimes you sit there and it's like, looks, it looks one color on the palette and then another color on the painting. And that sometimes help. What helps prevent that is using a neutral colored palette. You can see. The problem with white palettes is everything looks much brighter because it, the white is actually showing through. You put it on a neutral surface on your painting, it's like, that doesn't look right. It doesn't look like what you mixed. Sometimes with these, the burnt umber and the raw umber, when you add any white to them, they get much grayer when you don't want them to, especially raw umber. So you have to be careful of that because it can look like, what? I didn't put gray down there. I put brown down there and it turned gray. But that's just kind of the nature of the paint. And so you have to watch out for that. And when it happens, you can blend it out because as long as everything's wet and you're working with it, it's amazing how much you can just um, you keep blending and it's gone. More, some more raw sienna. This is where I have that big light area. Like I said, that's going to be skin color, but I don't want it to be too dark. But I don't want it to be too light either. And add a little medium. I'm actually running out of medium. The other thing you can do, I mean, this right now, since the white is wet, a lot of the white is um, blending right in. Of course, I'm getting some streakiness, but I can get rid of that later. But I can show you, I don't know if you can see the streakiness. This is where, when you get streakiness, that often comes from using too small a brush, but you can get a sable. Some of these are artificial sables. I don't like this well, but just try to pick a good one. Here's a really fat one. This is, I don't know what this is. It's a it's an old brush of my grandmother's. I think it's the she has one from Sears. Sears Robot used to sell everything. I mean, you could buy a house from Sears Robot, seriously. A kit, a kit house. You'd, you'd they'd give you all this pieces and you could pay a really super price and then put together your house from the kit, like a model. But see how this blends out. In fact, if I carried it through here, it would just blend out a lot. It's a little, the paint's a little bit dry, so. Um, but look at, I don't know if you can see that. It's just kind of blending everything. It's kind of interesting. This can be real good for backgrounds too. This, this, these blending brushes, because a lot of time, especially in landscapes, you want the background to be very soft and, and fuzzy. And so you can blend like that. You know, so I don't want to do her eyes because I don't want her eyes, the, the that part blending. But that kind of takes what I have and, and like I said, blends it. I really need to fill up my palette. Time's moving. I spent a lot of time talking at the beginning because we were just getting started and I wanted you to know certain concepts. We didn't get quite as far today. We still have some time. We keep track of the time. Just adding a little paint here and some medium. Come on, medium. Let's get out. That's my medium. It's backwards, of course. It's Neo McGulp.
Gamblin makes this. My favorite medium liquid is the most common. It's a good medium. I just like this better because it's it has a silkier feel to me. And I seriously need more raw sienna. It gives me that lighter yellower brown. Her skin really isn't real chocolatey. It's it's more um, like a, a darker brown than chocolatey. It's hard to describe, but it's more raw sienna than burnt sienna. How's that? Trying to um, keep the shape I've got it since that's so critical. This is that you can see here's the lighter area. So what I put in there before is going to mix. And even though I'm going to cover her eyelashes, I don't really care. I kind of put them in there because I don't know why. I just felt like it. Even though I knew I'd cover them up. I'm trying to not lose these lines. This is not a really good angle. One thing you can do if you're having a, a hard time getting your arm and your paint to go, because there's natural ways arms move, and you know, it's this motion is very difficult when you're painting to go that way. It's very natural to go this way. And especially on a small painting, sometimes it's more convenient to just hold it and paint on it like this, especially if you're trying to get your arm and your paintbrush in a, in a, um, so that they flow and work together very well. So I'm just gonna do this now. What's nice about it is you can move it in all different directions. So you're not just moving your brush and your arm, you're moving around your painting. You can't do this with a larger painting but it can be really, really great on a little painting like this. One of the reasons we use easels is that, so you can reach everything in your painting and actually, if it's, if it's at an angle, it can mess up your perspective because you're seeing things, you know, the closer things are still bigger, even on your painting, but it is hard to be leaning over your painting and reaching, um, Whereas on, on here, you're just going like this. You can reach everything much more easily. Of course, if you're dealing with a runny medium like watercolor, that's one reason they... A lot of watercolor tables are much flatter because it's such a liquid medium that it'll, it'll just run. And you don't want that either. See how some, well, some of these I haven't gone over. This is the best example right here where I put in that white, but it's not white. And I, I went over it lightly. I need a little medium. I don't want it too dark. Um, there is a streak of uh, almost white coming down here. This is getting a little too liney. I don't like that. This brush is old, I think, is that's what's causing it. <laughs> She's getting fur nose. I don't want fur nose. But like I said, you can get the sable, and that will take that out and blend it all. And even, you know, like there. I'm putting this back up. I just couldn't do that angle well. I have one on the other side. I should do that. Put the humps down. It's this top of the eye it was just a bad angle for me. And so that's why I took it down. See, I, I, I want it fairly light. It's 
upper part of the eye. Probably can't see that. It's, it's harder to see. Um, we got the critical part now. Now, I, I um, have said this before, I, I like to balance my painting on the very front edge of my easel because I don't like it feeling like I have to reach through past part of the easel to get to it. I like it right there on the surface. But you have to clamp it in because what you don't want is your painting to fall off the easel when you're in the middle of painting it. That's very disconcerting. <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> it's happened. It's really dark over there. It's coming down here. This is coming up here. We're kind of meeting. This is actually all dark. That's dark too, very dark. But I want a smaller brush for that. Just careful brush. Okay. I'm looking for a newer brush. That's not very good. A lot of these, uh, you want a nice thin brush on one side a lot of control and not one to sort of flare it out because with time they get flared out and sometimes it's hard because they don't always last very long and it's like oh, I want a one that's not flared and you can't find one because they're all flared out this is really pretty darn dark but it kind of transitions lighter so I'm going to start it dark this is the uh, upper part of upper lid the part that goes against the eye that the eyelashes are on. Her eyelashes are very hard to see in these photographs. So I know she's got them. I think she's like me. She's very fine here. Some of that line is a little rough, but it really gets dark down here. It's this terrible brush. You can say, I keep saying it's a terrible brush because I'm not getting the control I really want. It, and when you have a good brush, it can make all the difference in the control when you get to these small areas. And you can always get a paper towel and kind of alter it somewhat. And like I said, all this we're going to go over, blocking it in, but it's still, you know, it's nice if it's right the first time and you don't have to be constantly going over it, even though you do somewhat anyway. It's a very subtle little, very subtle little change here between the dark areas. I'm going to just try to get, I don't know if you, I don't want to totally block the camera, but um, I also need to get a, a good angle. I'm trying to see, you can see just this right, right in this under area and there's a little bit of lighter. Um, a lighter area that I'm trying to get in there while well, it's wet because I want it to blend with the darker. And you get the blending is just like totally best when it's wet. That's when you need to blend. Okay. 
and it gets real dark down in that corner. Let's see, I'll bet you had the same thing on that side. Oh man, that's dark. It looks really dark here. The sun just isn't reaching this area here. Let's see. Okay. See, this is an area where I can, the paper copy is, is the right scale. It's the same scale. So it's easier for me to, to kind of measure with my eyeballs as I paint on something that's the same scale. But the one on photo paper is, um, it shows the nuances of color a little better because this area looks black on the regular paper, but it's, it's more of a, um, a kind of really dark red, this area here, all the way to um, the eyeball. Yeah, it doesn't even look red. See if that can be a little redder. It's just not showing. Maybe I need a little, little white. White can really throw you off too, because sometimes it just makes everything milky instead of just lighter. And sometimes you don't want it milky. Because there's a clarity in the transparent colors that you just don't ever get any other way besides just um having that pure transparent color with the light shining through it. This is, I'm painting a much redder, but a lot of time if you paint it a little exaggerated in the underpainting and then you put paint over, it just kind of shows through just a hint and you end up with with more depth of color. Now, but that's true here. Oh boy, you don't see it much. But I want her eyes to have somewhat of a a sameness to them, even though this one is darker because it's further back. And then again, like I said, that area I was showing you where the light on the bottom lid, that flat area, there's not much of it showing here. It's because her I must have been pretty much at eye level with her lids, but you can see just a hint of a much lighter pinker area right before it goes into her, um, you know, until it meets the white of her eyes. And how light should I make this? I can, I can see pink right here. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in, even though it's very minimal. Because in the underpainting, it's much better to exaggerate a little bit rather than just make something all monotone. It's kind of inspirational, so to speak, for the, um, what comes on top. What you don't want is all your skin to be just the same. Because skin just goes in and out with all these different colors. Just, but they're just really subtle. See how flat, when I was talking about how the bottom lid is flat. It's, especially when people smile, their bottom lids, they go up. They just push up. You can sit there and make faces in front of the mirror. What a lot. That's fun too. It's true that it's pink, but it actually, because it's not, um, you know, it has a lot of kind of lumps and bumps in it. And so you'll get a lot of nuances and, and it's wet. So sometimes you get a lot of shine. I don't see much pink here, but I'm painting it pink anyway, because I don't want it to disappear into browns. Not totally, there's some in the end. It's really kind of hard to see too, but, but again, I don't want to lose it. 
You get the underside of the lid coming in here. It's pretty dark right there. When, as you paint, you'll find, as you get more and more experience as an artist, you'll find your your powers of observation improve greatly. And um, you'll just notice all these things that you never noticed before. I was married to my husband for years. Of course, he was getting older too, which helps. But I, I was painting his portrait. This was, when was this? It must have been in... A long time ago, we might have been around 2000. Yeah, no, it was after that. It's probably about 2005. Anyway, this this part of your eyelid here, your eyelid. Some people, as they get older, especially this this part here, get, goes down till you don't even see the eyelid. Sometimes. Mine aren't like that, but his mother's are. She had to have surgery because this, this upper thing came down so low. It was making it, it was blocking her vision. She had to have surgery. And anyway, so one of his eyelids doesn't show. It's all kind of, you know, the skin goes over there from above. And the other one does show. It's not dramatically different, but it's definitely there. I never noticed that. And I checked his twin brother. His twin brother does it. His eyes don't do that. It's just this one eye, Steve's eye, that does that. And, you know, when, there was some birth trauma when he was born. And he he had his, his face, was, his head was really squashed because they were, both, they were over seven pounds each. And their mother's only five, two. But, and they eventually had to do a C-section. But his, he was crammed in the birth canal and his face and head was all squashed. And so I wonder, is that by that way because of that original birth trauma? It's possible. Okay, where was I? I want this lid. I've got a lot of pink on my... Bush. There's actually some darkness in there, and I'm kind of keeping track of things. I'm going to have to... It's getting late. I apologize for starting a little bit late today. I was having a little problems with my phone. So, um, I'm just checking the time. This is basically where we're at. I'm going to just add a little bit of paint on this ear because... I one, I've got it left too. I haven't done much to that ear and I don't want to forget the ear. There's a lot of like, um, well, sienna in there. It's a little layer. That's some white. And then, of course, this light, you know, the, the top of that ear always gets light. Just kind of blocking that in. And it's really dark in the corner. What's that? Ooh, ooh. It's this right here, and then it gets lighter, a little lighter as it goes out here. And then her actually her hair. What I want to do is kind of define this darkness as her ear goes around, even though it's it's kind of um, you know she it, it isn't just an even black she she has her hair has motion and um, you know that whoa factor. It's kind of flying out over there a little bit. It's not very long. She keeps it pretty short. And that is kind of background actually beyond that. It doesn't, the picture doesn't do much for you there. You can basically add in whatever you want. On the painting, I, the portrait, I the eyes that I did of me, I put aspens in the background because I love aspens. So I figured, sure. 
I love asking so. Yeah, that's nice. Now, even though it's, oh man, it's just like time to go. Um, but you can see, you know, we've got a good start here. A lot of um, indication is certainly not filled out all the way, but it's pretty much. And at this stage, it's good to step back and look at it. And like I say every week, once you start painting and you paint for a while and put it up on the other end of the room, and go back, you know, go to bed, get up in the morning, look at the painting after you've been away from it for a while. And before you start a painting session, do that too. You need to step back, take a look, take notes if you need to. So this is what we're, we're finished up for tonight. This is blocking in the painting and learning a lot about painting eyes and composition and things like that. So next week, we're going to be taking it from here and developing these skin tones. Again, not no eyelashes yet, but we want all of the folds and the nuances. So that's for next week. Same time, same station from 7 to 9. So we will see you then, and thank you for watching.